Hi, so this will be your lecture for this first session. It should be just, um, shouldn't take more than an hour, it should be under an hour. All right, so I will post this PowerPoint as well so that you have access to it. But this covers chapters one, two, and 22. So your future in healthcare, we're looking at, um, you know, this is really the largest industry in the United States, or at least one of them. And there's a huge need um, for healthcare professionals. There's so many different careers that you can, um, that you can choose. It's very fulfilling, of course, if you enjoy working with people and you help other people on a daily basis. So that's part of why it's such a rewarding uh, career area. However, it can be extremely demanding and you have to be thoughtful and, and conscientious about everything that you do because mistakes can be extremely devastating. And you'll be learning about that through your IHI modules as well. Qualities that you wanna have is caring about others, having integrity, being dependable but flexible. We are working with human beings. So if we're not flexible and understand that things are gonna change and things are likely not gonna go as planned, you know, it's not gonna be um, a very fun career choice. You always have to be willing to learn. In fact, that's um, a requirement for most of our licensures is that we are consistently learning and strive to be cost conscious. We're going to talk a, a little bit today about um, paying for healthcare, as well as ways in which you as a healthcare professional can um, help control costs. So something that you may want to consider is volunteering. Some programs actually require it. I don't believe that there's any at Monroe that do, but other places may. It can help you learn job skills and help you even determine what career choice you might want. You might get, be able to have exposure to a career choice that you didn't even know existed. And it's great for your resume as well, which we'll be doing at the end of this course. Professional organizations is another area where you can find some standards as well as you can find um, networking as well as learning opportunities in a specific area. So when you do your project here starting in the next session, um, that's where you'll want to look at a professional organization that has to do with uh, your career choice. So. For example, I'm part of the American Nurses Association, and so that kind of keeps me up to date on things as well as NLN, which is the National League for Nursing, and that has to do a lot with nursing education. Making a career decision, so you want to look at a lot of different things, and that's, again, these are things that you're going to be looking at when you uh, do your project. So your education required, your natural abilities and personality traits. So what, um, what does your personality, how does that align with what you might want to do? What do you enjoy doing? And your preferences for work environments. We're going to talk a little bit about different types of settings for healthcare today as well. Career ladder. So these are levels of occupations within a professional field. And so they do require different levels of education or training. And so a career ladder in nursing would start with a certified nurse assistant, then an LPN, which usually requires about a year of training, um, a registered nurse, which requires two to four years, and then a nurse practitioner, which requires a master's or a doctoral degree. Levels of education, so generally considered a professional is four years or more of college, a technologist or a therapist is somewhere three to four years. Of course, that depends on the, the type of technologist or therapist because a physical therapist requires um, graduate level work too. A technician or assistant is usually an associate's degree, vocational training or on the job training, and then an aide is vocational or on the job training. And so we have, um, you know, lots of different opportunities here at the college, including aides, um, kind of technician type or technologist uh, type of training here. 
So different standards for healthcare professionals. So as I mentioned, um, you know, there's licensure, there's also certification. So this is where um, someone has to meet predetermined standards. It requires education on a professional exam, such as a certified medical assistant, a certified nurse assistant, or a certified occupational therapy assistant. Registration is when somebody's on an actual list uh, showing that they've met predetermined standards. So a registered nurse, a registered respiratory therapist, a registered medical assistant. And then licensure is when someone has been given formal permission to perform certain tasks. So this is usually um, given by a government agent, such as a state um, nursing board. And it may vary from state to state as to what the requirements are. Although there may be something called reciprocity where, um, like as a nurse, I can go to different states and practice. I just have to apply for their license. I don't usually have to take another test or anything. Um, I usually just have to pay for another license. So a dentist, an LPN, um, a dental hygienist have licensure as well. Career categories. So there's therapeutic and uh, treatment occupations, and these help patients attain or regain maximum wellness. So we'll give some examples of each of these. Diagnostic occupations. So this helps determine cause and extent of illness or injury. So it's really looking at you know, pathology that's going on. Health information management occupations. So this is really looking at patient documentations and, and patient information. And then environmental occupations is um, help and maintain a therapeutic environment for our patients. So these will make a little bit more sense coming up here. Therapeutic and treatment occupations. So these are a lot of the ones that we think of right away. Um, dental, um, in a medical office, mental health, nursing, occupational or physical therapy, respiratory therapy, but you also have you know, veterinary or vision care. Diagnostic occupations, we don't want to overlook these. A lot of people really enjoy these. So diagnostic imaging, so those that work in radiology or nuclear medicine and medical laboratories. Health information management occupations, so, you know, medical transcriptionists or coding specialists, you know, they, they need a lot of people in these areas because everything that's done has to be coded properly. And then environmental occupations, nutrition and dietary services would fall under here. Biomedical engineering, I can tell you I, I don't know a lot about biomedical engineering, except that it's a vastly growing field with some really good paying jobs in it. So it might be something that you want to research a little bit. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about healthcare, um, how it was, how it is today, and what we hope for for the future. So um, Western healthcare has changed um, quite a bit and now we're progressing very rapidly. And it used to be that infectious diseases was a major cause of death for the most part, not including COVID-19, for the most part we've been able to control a lot of infectious diseases. And so what really has become uh, more of a problem is chronic illness, like heart disease. So that's been a huge shift in um, healthcare. There's been a ton of technological advances. I can't tell you, I started um, in healthcare in I think 98, and the amount of changes that I've seen in technology since then are just amazing. And so, I mean, organ transplants take place every day now. Um, robotic surgeries, gene therapies, targeted drug therapies, uh, and pharmaceuticals. Uh, the amount of different medications that we have to treat things is just amazing. We'll talk a little bit more about um, gene therapy. So hopes for the future, vaccines or cures for things like HIV, AIDS, obesity, being able to clone organs so that we don't have to wait for someone to pass away in order to um, you know, have organs to transplant. Cures for cancer and heart disease. I'm a mental health nurse at heart, and so being having better treatments for mental illness is something that's near and dear to my heart, and, and I hope for that in the future. Having less invasive treatments, um, medications that are 
better, that have less side effects because they target the areas of the body um, more efficiently. And then a COVID-19 vaccine would be something that we hope for very soon. So there's something called specialization, and this has been a growing trend in healthcare for quite some time now. And so specialization really means that caring for something more specific. So it can help. There's benefits to specialization, to going to specialists for care because they're better at diagnosing and treatment for those very specific illnesses. However, um, it can be more technical, more fragmented because then you're going to different specialists for different things and specialists are more expensive. So it increased costs. There may not be as much um, patient provider relationships because you're only going to see a cardiologist for cardiac care and a pulmonologist for lung care and an oncologist just for that cancer care. And you may be seeing somebody for the chemotherapy and another person for the radiation therapy. So um, it can really fragment things. However, it, it does allow for a lot of job opportunities in very specialized areas. Another thing that's, that's definitely affecting um, healthcare now is the age of our population. So the life expectancy has increased from 47 years in, in around 1900 to about 80 years now. And our baby boomers are now older adults and they are our heaviest users of healthcare services. They need more long-term care, more home care, and more treatments for chronic conditions. And those are all things we're gonna mention here in just a few minutes again. The cost of health care. So it goes to hospitals and physicians and, and clinics. Um, it's extremely expensive. And it's, it's um, growing faster than other products and services. The affordability of health care is a major social as well as a political issue. And of course, it brings up is health care right or privilege. So those are things that you may have had discussions about, um, you know, previously. New approaches to healthcare. So looking for alternatives to surgery and drugs. We want to be able to do more than just, you know, cut some, cut a patient, and give them a prescription. So more patients want more natural remedies, and there's. Uh, more of a belief in the mind-body connection, which again is something that's important to me because I've been able to, to see that transition where we begin to understand that mental illness is not just something that's in the mind, but it's a brain condition. It, there is pathology. There are things going wrong with the brain that cause mental illness. We're starting to focus more on prevention than cure. And if we can prevent things from happening, then we don't have to spend all this time and money trying to cure it. People are learning that they have a responsibility for their own health care. It's not just up to the prescriber, the physician, or the nurse practitioner to cure them. It's up to them to try to help prevent it and to manage chronic illnesses once they do have them. Patients have more access to information than ever before. Now, it's not always credible information, and so we do get patients that are misinformed, but they do have more information at their fingertips than previously. And there's this desire to increase the humanization of medicine. So what we're going to talk about here in just a minute is that medicine has always traditionally been the treatment of illness, disease, injury. So medicine was the treatment of a fractured leg. It was the treatment of diabetes. And now we're looking at it as treating people that have certain conditions. So we're trying to humanize it more and remember that there are people that are suffering from these conditions, not just a condition in front of us. So that's where we get into the whole concept of wellness, that we want patients to not just not have a disease, but that they're able to practice um, healthy behaviors, that they're 
rather um, than focusing on their limitations, they can focus on their possibilities, that they can take responsibility for their own healthy lifestyle. And um, so part of this is the more of an more of looking at things holistically. So holistic medication is a more expanded view of traditional medicine. And so it looks at things like reducing stress, nutrition, physical activity, positive attitude. It's more than just healthcare providers being responsible for this individual patient. And if you think about it, then we're able to help patients be more empowered and they're able to contribute to multiple aspects of health, not just physical health, but their emotional, mental, and spiritual health too. So Western medicine has always been based on a very scientific approach. It's that pathology. It's what's going wrong in the body. And it's that cure of disease. It's treating someone with drugs and surgery. But there's lots of different approaches to healthcare as well. And so some of you may choose to go into more complementary or alternative types of medications. I personally um, prefer an integrative medication, uh, medicine, not medication, medicine approach where we're looking at um, Western complementary and alternative medicine altogether. So complementary medicine is used together with conventional medicine. Alternative medicine is used instead of. And if you question certain types of complementary or alternative medicine, you can go to the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health, and that can give some research and information. So it's some credible information on those different types of services. So unfortunately, complementary and alternative medicine is susceptible to fraud. They want people to pay for it before they're able to see what kind of outcomes that they have. They may claim to cure things that they don't. Um, they may have uh, may use terms that people don't understand because no definition actually really exists. They may have people that uh, you know claim that they've been helped, but there's really no documentation that it's helped. So and we'll talk a little bit more about those here in a minute. The future of healthcare, uh, this is amazing to me, is that we can look at more personalized or precision medicine. And so genomic research or looking at people's DNA has been able to help us make treatments more specific. So for example, in mental health, People can have their blood drawn and sent out, especially if there's someone where we're having difficulties finding the right antidepressant or bipolar medication, um, ADHD medication, trying to find the correct one for the person. So they can have their blood drawn and it will help us to understand how they metabolize different types of medications. And so the, the pronouns will actually be like red uh, yellow green and say don't use these ones the, the person doesn't metabolize it or they metabolize it so fast that it can't build up in their system um, you know use certain ones with caution those are called yellow and then green are the person should respond really well to these and it's all based on the person's DNA and how their liver metabolizes um, the different medications it's really interesting uh, so that's where we come in with diagnosis and treatment based on biochemical makeup. And it does give us a hope for curing cancers. Challenges in healthcare. So we're going to spend a few minutes on this. So providing affordable healthcare is a huge challenge. So um, when we talk about healthcare, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the Affordable Care Act, but even with the Affordable Care Act, there's still a huge cost to health care. So unfortunately, it's something that has not been fixed. Providing long-term care, our older adults need long-term care. And it's not always the quality that we would want and the, the cost of it is increasing drastically. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about Medicare and Medicaid and how that also you know, doesn't necessarily cover everything that's needed in long-term care. There's something called a health disparity. So a health disparity is unfortunately um, where we see 
um, the health of different populations is different. So it may be based on social economic status or minority status. And basically it means that if somebody um, has a particular minority status that they may not have the same access to healthcare and therefore their health isn't as good as those who are not in that same minority um, group. Social conditions leading to healthcare problems. So this has to do with things like uh, poverty, homelessness, violence, abuse, um, malnutrition. So those are social conditions that then lead to health problems. Racism is something that we don't necessarily always think of in healthcare, but there can be discrimination in healthcare and that can lead to a lower quality care for certain patients. So there can be limited access because of somebody's race. And then there's something called implicit racism. And this is something that's getting more um, awareness, but it's where there's racism that's present, but it's not in somebody's consciousness. Somebody's not choosing to be racist, but they have some um, implicit racism. So it's kind of, it's kind of, hidden or less obvious, but it still affects the way in which they treat other people. Maintaining quality of care. So what happens when uh, costs go up? Well, quality, we, we try to cut those costs. And so that can then decrease the, the quality that is given. So it might be the amount of care, or it may just be that, um, you know, the same level of care isn't given. And unfortunately, what has happened with trying to cut costs is that often we have insurance companies determining what care should be given to a patient instead of their healthcare providers. Alzheimer's disease and the treatment of it is a challenge in healthcare right now too. So as we mentioned, we have an increase in older adult population, which is where we see most Alzheimer's disease patients. And um, it's the sixth leading cause of death in the United States, one in nine people over 65 and one in three over 85. And it may have cost upwards of $277 billion in 2018. Public health concerns. So we see things like pandemics um, that we're all, all too familiar with at this point. And so influenza, COVID-19, things like that are public health concerns. E um, medication adherence. So people may not take medications that help prevent health conditions. So maybe people don't take their antihypertensive medications and they end up with a heart attack or a stroke from that. And it may be because the medications are too expensive or because of the side effects of the medications. They don't like it. So medication adherence, you know, as a healthcare professional, trying to help patients understand why treatments or medications are necessary, the importance and the consequences of not taking it is a really important step for us. I apologize, opioid crisis should be its own bullet point here, but um, opiates, if you're not aware, are painkillers that are addictive, and they used to be highly promoted by pharmaceutical companies. There's been a huge crackdown in prescribing opiates and access to opiates and so, because we're trying to combat this crisis. But in 2017, 45,000 people died from opiate overdoses. Another major issue is um, preventing prescription drug overuse. So you know, there, there's pain clinics and things out there to help so people aren't using too many prescription medications. We teach patients how to control pain using other avenues. So um, I'll share a little bit about myself. I'm, I'm someone who has a couple of chronic pain conditions. And so I do take medications regularly for that, but I also use heat and massage and stretching and um, physical therapy. So there, there's lots of other ways to try to minimize the amount of medications that you know, I'm using. 
suicide prevention is something that's near and dear to my heart as well. So the rate has drastically increased over the last couple decades. In 2016, there was 45,000 suicides, and that takes a huge emotional and economic cost. The need to emphasize prevention in healthcare. So that's the biggest step that we can take is making prevention a priority. If we can prevent these chronic illnesses or even some acute illnesses from happening, then we don't have to spend all this time and money um, trying to treat them. It decreases morbidity and mortality. Preventing antibiotic resistance. So you probably heard of something called MARSA and that's um, a staff infection that is resistant to its methicillin, but uh, to specific hardcore um, antibiotics that should treat these types of infections and they just don't work. And a lot of it has to do with over prescribing. So, you know, people will come in with cold type symptoms and demand an antibiotic for it and they would get it. And the problem is, is a cold is a virus and antibiotics treat bacterial infections, not viral infections. And so what happens is, is then the bacteria that does live in your body, things start to become immune to those antibiotics. And we um, end up just getting stronger and stronger bacterial infections. TV prescription drug ads, so this is an interesting one. So average viewer sees about 30 hours of prescription um, drug ads annually. And there's a lot of belief that people shouldn't be seeing those. You know, we shouldn't be going in and demanding the newest medication to treat an illness because as a consumer, we don't understand the side effects generally. The average consumer doesn't understand, you know, the side effects and how those drugs may interact with the other medications that somebody takes or interfere with the other illnesses that somebody mm -hmm. has. And so it's really important that people understand that those things might not be the best choice for them. Healthcare facilities and services. So um, there's lots and lots of different healthcare facilities, and they help patients with different needs. So they may be private offices or national organizations. And the good thing about having all the different types of facilities is that you may be able to have your choice in what type of facility you want to work in. We generally always think of hospitals as the most traditional um, setting, but we're actually transitioning out of hospitals a lot. Hospitals are really limited to those patients who need 24 hour care. They're very expensive. Um, you know, these are things like patients who they may initially go in for ER and then they need cardiac care units or intensive care units or even a general unit or a rehabilitation unit. And so people don't stay in the hospital like they used to. People are in and out very quickly. I had brain surgery a couple years ago and I was in the neuro ICU for one night and the neuro floor for another night. So I had a, I had a small craniotomy and was in the hospital two nights. You know, so people just don't stay in the hospital like they used to anymore. Hospital expenses, so diversify um, services, eliminate duplication of services. That's a big one. So people used to go, they would go to their different healthcare providers and they'd all order the same labs because they didn't have access. So now having some centralized, um, you know, charting, uh, where they can access lab results from two weeks ago and things that helps with duplication of services. And merging with other hospitals or joining those large healthcare systems where they all have the same um, charting system and can access the charts, that, the, the charting that other um, healthcare professionals do helps with those expenses. ER visits, this is a huge area for cost control. Net. Some people use ERs like a primary care doctor instead of reserving it for those things that are most important. And the issue is, is that ER visits are very expensive. Um, so people do need to, to understand and be educated about when to use an ER. Uh, Fortunately, some, we are seeing a little bit of help with the increase in um, urgent cares. So people may go to urgent care for those less emergent needs. 
Things like ambulatory outpatient services is for those patients who don't require hospitalization. So most surgeries are done outpatient now. Um, there's a lots and lots. I, my mom had a hip replacement and that was done outpatient. You know, so those surgeries where people used to be in the hospital for a week or more, now they go in and they leave the same day. A lot of ambulatory services are also provided by physicians' offices. Long-term care facilities, so these are patients who don't need hospitalization, but they really can't go home yet. So they need um, help. This is a huge area of growth. There's different types of, uh, of long-term care facilities, nursing home, adult, foster home, assisted living. So you'll see people where they, they live in a place where um, it's not as intense as a, as a nursing home, but they will have somebody that comes in and checks on them and make sure they get their medication and things. Home health care services, so this is a huge area of growth as well because, again, because patients aren't in the hospital this long, they go home and they still need care. They may still need physical therapy or occupational therapy or maybe a wound care nurse. They go home with a wound that needs packed instead of being in the hospital for a week getting their wound packed. So, you know, that older population benefits from this a lot. Uh, they have medical equipment that they can go home with now instead of having to be there in the hospital. And it can be beneficial to patients because they get to be in their own home. Not only is that more comfortable for them, but then they're not exposed to the other patients in the hospital. Hospice, I've had some personal as well as um, professional experiences with hospice. And this is palliative care and support for dying patients and their families. So usually it's at the end of life, usually within the last six months of life. And um, it, it's a team of professionals as well as volunteers, and it really gives a very holistic approach to help make sure that the last days of a person's or last months of a person's life is meaningful and as pain-free as, as possible. So um, my personal experiences with it have been, you know, very beneficial, and I was glad that my um, family members were able to go into hospice care. Consolidation of healthcare services. So this is what I mentioned about, you know, kind of having one ownership, lots of different facilities under one umbrella. So something like ProMedica that you're probably all familiar with would fall underneath this. And so they're able to have some um, cost cutting measures by buying things in large quantities, sharing equipment, uh, reduction in duplication of services, sharing their knowledge. Um, However, and it can be more consistent. However, it can decrease the competition. So there's not as much competition among hospitals or among providers, and therefore patients have fewer choices and there's not as much drive to lower costs. There's um, other types of facilities. I'm not going to go into this a whole lot, but know that pharmacies now are uh, an increased, the are an area in which a lot of people go get their immunizations. It's where my family goes and gets our immunizations now. Government health services are supported by the taxpayers. And so these, um, you'll see them at the federal, the state and the local levels. We're probably more familiar now with these because of the pandemic, but you've heard of the NIH and the CDC. I imagine those are federal levels. State levels are like our licensing um, boards and they may help with public health, as well as our local government um, health services, which, you know, like our county um, health departments and things, they uh, gather statistics. And right now with the pandemic, they may even be making recommendations for what um, our school should be doing about going back to school. Okay, the last part of this session is paying for healthcare. I am gonna breeze over a few of the errors pretty quickly, so uh, I will primarily want you to pay attention to what I'm emphasizing in this section. Some of it can get pretty confusing. So the cost of healthcare, we in the United States pay so much more for healthcare than other countries. And it has to do, there, there's lots and lots of different um, reasons, but some of it has to do with the costs are um, 
rising for what is being charged for healthcare, defensive medicine, meaning that doctors want to cover their butts and make sure they don't miss something. The technology, the technological advances, everybody wants to use the newest and greatest technology, but it's expensive. The overuse of specialists. So even though you may get better treatment with a the specialist, they're much more expensive. And then there's waste and fraud, of course. Um, we also look at the aging population as a reason for um, an increase in cost, as well as, unfortunately, the declining health of our youth and people's poor lifestyle choices. As well as there are so many um, people out there that have incurred these high costs, these high medical costs, and so they can end up bankrupt or just have huge amounts of medical debt. Um, different types of healthcare institutions, again, I'm not going to go into detail with this, but they can, there can be nonprofit, for profit, or government. When we look at um, reimbursement for healthcare, so physicians can determine the cost for services, and then insurances became the method of paying. And so, what what has kind of transitioned, instead of physicians deciding how much something costs, insurance companies decide how much they're gonna pay. So different payment methods, there can either be direct pay to providers, um, private insurances that are purchased by patients, which is what a lot of, a lot of people do, or there's government funded programs where the government, um, where people are on government plans to pay for services. Uh, these two government plans, I do want to make sure that we have an understanding, so I will want you to know the difference between Medicaid and Medicare. Medicaid, we think about aiding those with low income and disabilities. So it's administered by the states. Um, it does have a lot to do with nursing home um, costs, coverage. Medicare is also for, is for our older adults. So if we think about care for older adults and disabled people who qualify for social security. So it does have a premium. Um, there are different parts to it. It covers about 80% of approved charges, which means there's still 20% still that needs to be covered. So um, Medicare has Medigap policies where somebody, you can purchase an extra policy to help cover that 20%, which can be um, a lot of money. There's something called a deductible, which is what a patient pays for um, before the insurance will, will pick up the rest of the amount, or they may pay a coinsurance or both. And a coinsurance would be if, if Medicare covers 80%, the coinsurance would be the 20% that the patient pays. And then there's the Veterans Health Administration. So it's the largest integrative healthcare system in the United States. It's not perfect, but it does help a lot of our veterans who meet qualifications. So the biggest takeaway from this is to know the difference between Medicare and Medicaid. There's efforts to control um, costs. There's a diagnostic related group which means that they set standard payment for services. So the government can kind of set some of that through um, you know, Medicare, Medicaid. And the other thing that's really good with Medicare is that uh, in order to contract with Medicare to have them reimburse for services, they, the organization has to meet, uh, the healthcare facility has to meet certain standards. And so that does help ensure that our uh, that patients are getting a certain minimum standard. Managed care is uh, organizations negotiate with providers to form networks to try to help make care more affordable, more cost uh, effective, um, and decrease duplication as well as earn a profit. So they are for money. So types of managed care are HMOs, PPOs, point of service, EPOs. So again, I'm not going to go into the real specifics with this, but um, just know that those are types of managed care. Payment methods. So they can be prepaid plans, negotiated fees, or they can have it where the primary care provider is kind of the gatekeeper and helps to 
um, recommend and approve um, any type of specialist or, or, or anything that someone may see. So it's a control measure. Primary care payment methods. So review of services, what that means is that insurance companies determine what costs are going to be paid and they may require pre-authorization so you might not be able to have things um, diagnostic procedures or a surgery done unless it's pre-authorized through an insurance company so what this means again it's a cost um, trying to reduce costs but it means that insurance companies may be the ones that are deciding if a patient gets the treatment that their provider has has decided they need Problems with insurance, um, you know, private health care coverage, um, two of the biggest things was that they may require a physical and that they may not cover someone who has a pre-existing condition. And so a big way to combat that was the Affordable Care Act in 2010. And so it, it had some really, really good pieces to it. It wasn't I mean, there's political issues with it. You know, there's all kinds of, of problems with it, but it did help some of those people that would have been previously denied um, health insurance coverage. One of the issues is that it required people to purchase health care coverage. And so, um, you know, not everybody wants to do that, and then they'd have to pay a fee. Some parts of it have been repealed, so it's not, it's no longer all in effect. And basically where we stand right now is we're not sure what the future of healthcare in the United States looks like, particularly, you know, payment for healthcare. Is it gonna to continue to be private insurance primarily, or is there gonna be some sort of public um, insurance policy? So we'll see in the next, next several years. So now we're, last part um, here is controlling organizational costs. So when we look at, you know, the resources, financing, uh, technology and supplies, facilities, personnel, and those all go into the cost of healthcare delivery system. So when we think about these things, there's some terms that we use. Expenditure is the money spent doing business. Account receivable is money owed to a business. Account payable is money of a, a business owes to others. And the cost of money is the value can, that can be returned on money invested. So those are just some definitions that you'll want to um, have an idea of. Impacting costs. So as a healthcare provider, can you reduce unnecessary costs? Can you be personally efficient? Can you focus on what you're doing and be careful with those supplies and equipment that you use? And then can you help ensure that things are billed and code properly? So you need to make sure you document because you can't bill for things that aren't documented. And then if you're part of someone who, if you're um, part of your job is coding is making sure that those things are coded properly so that they are reimbursed. Um, some of you may be kind of young and not privy to this information yet, but I can tell you I've had where I've had where my doctor's office had codes coded something wrong and my insurance denied it. And so I had to fight with them, get it recoded, set back, and then the insurance approved it. So the coding part can have a big um, can be a big headache if not done properly. You're going to maintain inventory, educate your patients. Your patients should be empowered and educated to be able to, you know, speak to what they need and what they don't need. And be willing to cross-train. As a healthcare professional, if you can perform different um, duties, that's going to help. So, you know, that you're not, you're not just a specialist, that you can be a little bit more generalized and utilized in, in multiple ways. Personal efficiency. So there's some things that you as an individual can do so that you're efficient as well. So make sure that you're problem solving, that you're responsible, that you don't become sidetracked, that you pay attention to what you're doing. Expect that you're not always just going to progress, that there's going to be some setbacks. Eliminate those time wasters. I'll talk about that um, in the optional lecture that I'll post. And that you communicate clearly and honestly, that you look at your life as a whole, and that you act with thought. So we do that by asking what are the facts, what's the best course of action, what's the right thing to do, and what is the probable impact of my actions. So we're always, we always want to act with thought as a healthcare provider. 
So I know this was a lot of information. Feel free to review this um, PowerPoint as needed. Uh, do make sure that you're paying attention to the objectives at the beginning of the chapter because that is where all of the questions on your exam um, will come from. And I hope you enjoyed this. Look forward to uh, next lecture. <laughs>